All right, so I want to take you back to another uh, property of the Z transform. Uh, again, we're not deriving this, but it's the time shifting property. Notice that if you have a signal x of n and you delay by n naught samples in the z domain, you're going to you're going to multiply the z transform by z to the minus n naught. So let's let's go back down now and start to apply this. I've repeated that time shift property right here. A delay by d samples, you get in the z domain a multiplication by z to the minus d. So uh, let's take a look at um, a difference equation. Remember that the difference equation is a very general description for uh, linear time invariant systems and discrete time. And um, notice that the, the, uh, the difference equation is given by a sum of delayed copies of the output and delayed copies of the input on both sides here. So if we apply this um, time delay property to the Z transform or to the difference equation by taking the Z transform of both sides, notice what we get out of this. Um, we get z to the, for, in fact, I'm going to step down here. Uh, y of n minus k goes to z to the minus k y of z. x n minus k goes to z to the minus k x of z. And um, notice that uh, y of z doesn't depend on k. x of z doesn't depend on k. So we can actually factor those out of the sums and solve for the ratio of y over x. And that is called the transfer function, again, of a linear time invariant system. And um, if we do that, notice that then we would then have this polynomial in terms of a in the denominator, polynomial in terms of the b coefficients in the numerator. So we end up with this um, rational function, uh, ratio of two polynomials, b of z divided by a of z, where a and b are given by these polynomials. Um, so uh, again, this is for a, a linear time invariant system. The Z transform ends up as a rational function, a ratio of two polynomials. The other thing that's interesting here is that if you are given a difference equation and you express it in this canonical form that you see at the top of the page, then we can very quickly and very easily, almost by inspection, write down the transfer function because we just take these same coefficients in the difference equation and we use them in a polynomial for both the b's and the a's. Or given a rational function, we could also, by inspection, write down the difference equation. So there's this very quick one-to-one -one correspondence between difference equations and rational functions uh, where we don't really have to do any work. Of course, if we wanted to know the impulse response, we would need to find the inverse Z transform of this uh, rational function. We don't yet know how to do that, but we'll, we will very shortly. And, um, so um, let's uh, do a couple of transformations on this rational function. So I've outlined the three steps here. We're first going to factor out the b0, the first coefficient in the numerator, and the first coefficient in the denominator. We're going to pull those out and just uh, represent that as a constant out in front. The other thing, step two, is we're going to factor z to the minus m. That's the highest negative power of z in the numerator. We're going to factor that out, and we'll factor out z to the negative n in the denominator. Again, that's the highest power of z in the denominator. Why are we doing that? Because now we have a polynomial in positive powers of z, both in the numerator and denominator, instead of powers, uh, uh, negative powers of z. And um, so, so the z to the negative m and z to the n come out here uh, in the front. We can put those together. That's step number two. And then finally, we're going to take those remaining polynomials and we'll factor those. So uh, we, the, again, the roots of the numerator, those are called zeros, and we will denote those by z to the k. And there are m of those. And then the roots of the denominator polynomial, there are n of those, and we'll call those p of k. Those are the poles. And um, a couple of statements down here at the bottom of the page sort of uh, just tell us what's, what's going on here in this rational function. If n is greater than m, in other words, if, this, uh, if the degree of the de denominator is greater than the degree of the numerator, that's called a proper rational function, then uh, we find that there are um, n minus m zeros at z equals 0. Uh, when we look at poles and zeros in the end. Uh, 
On the other hand, if, uh, if m is greater than n, so it's an improper rational function, the degree of the numerator being greater than the degree of the denominator, then we would find that we had m greater than n, or n minus m, I'm sorry, poles at z equals 0. We can also have poles and zeros and or zeros occurring at z equal infinity. We get poles at infinity if x of infinity is equal to infinity, and zeros at infinity if x of 0 equals infinity. Um, when you count the poles and zeros at infinity, a rational function will have equal numbers of poles and zeros. Just a few things to keep in mind there. Um, this is showing uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the steps along the way. When we factor, um, after we factor out these coefficients from the numerator denominator polynomial, we could leave the uh, polynomials in terms of z to the minus 1 and re-express them in this form that you see here. Um, what, you know, wh whichever one of those uh, we do uh, is, is, is fine, and, and uh, we should feel comfortable dealing with either. Um, it's just sometimes one is more convenient than the other. And this, this says that there are m finite zeros and n finite poles. The remainder either appear at zero or at, at infinity, uh, and are either poles or zeros. Now we're moving on to calculating the inverse Z transform. And I've, I've put a, uh, a link to a paper, a really nice paper, um, on the inverse Z transform computation. Uh, I, again, a link for this on our class website. Um, the title is Fair and Square Computation of Inverse Z Transforms of Rational Functions. And um, essentially, uh, the, the, the met a method is to take a rational function and expand it in a partial fraction expansion. And as you know from past experience, partial fractions can go a number of different ways. You can have simple poles, you can have repeated poles, you can have complex conjugate pairs of poles, uh, higher order poles, you know, all these sorts of things are possible. And he lays all of this out here in the table. But once you do the partial fraction expansion, then it's a simple matter to just write down the inverse Z transform, um, as you can see in these examples. Um, but I know that you've seen partial fractions before in your days in calculus. And I know when you dealt with continuous time signals and systems, you also um, spent some time thinking about partial fractions expansions. And I just don't see a reason to continue to um, follow that course and drag you through further partial fraction expansion calculations. I know you can do it, and if, you, if you've forgotten, you can go back and, and read up on that. What I would like to do is introduce you to something new, and that is doing partial fractions on a computer. And so if you go into MATLAB and uh, type help residue z, uh, which is the function for doing partial fraction expansion in MATLAB, uh, of the kind that we're interested, um, you get this help message that scrolls down. And I'm showing part of that here on the screen. Um, if you read this, uh, notice that you pass in b and a. Remember in MATLAB, you represent a rational function in terms of vectors of coefficients, b for the numerator, a for the denominator. And so basically what we're doing, what we're passing into this residue z function is a transfer function. It's a representation of a transfer function. And it says this finds the residues, which are the numerators in the partial fraction expansion, the poles in the vector p, and other direct terms. And I'll talk about, um, in, in fact, I'll just tell you right now, the direct terms show up when um, you have this case uh, here, when m is greater than n. So when the degree of the numerator is greater than or equal to the, de the degree of the denominator, then you will have direct terms. Otherwise, if it's a proper rational function, the direct terms just won't exist. So let's, let's take a look at some of these terms that show up. So first of all, we could see terms like this, uh, where you have uh, some residue divided by 1 minus a pole times z to the minus 1. And then, and then you could have a whole list of these things being added together in the partial fraction expansion. The um, direct terms are either constant, or they're multiplied by z to the minus 1. And, um, the nice thing is that with the partial fraction expansion, uh, 
uh, we know how to very easily write down, in fact there's no work to be done, there, we just write down the inverse Z transform. So um, again, uh, I'm glad that this uh, uh, warning message is here to remind us that um, what, what I'm showing you now and moving forward is, uh, is based on the assumption that the region of convergence is outside the outermost pole. And so we'll be writing down uh, causal sequences. Okay, so for that case, um, again, this term is going to give us a causal inversely transform. So we have the residue times the pole raised to the n times u of n. Why, why do we get this causal term instead of an anti-causal term? Well, again, the reason is because the region of convergence lies outside this pole, which means it's causal. And um, uh, so each one of these uh, terms here in the partial fraction expansion is going to give us a causal inverse transform, basically just decaying exponentials. How about the direct terms? Well, the direct terms, look, look at what the direct terms are. This is a constant. The inverse Z transform of a constant is a delta times that constant. Remember, this is a Kronecker delta. How about, what's the inverse Z transform of Z to the minus 1, single sample delay? Well, it's a constant times that single sample delay, times delta n minus 1, and so on. So you could have a bunch of these terms, each with higher, higher orders of delay. The next term would be k3, z to the minus 2. Well, that would give us k3, delta n minus 2, and so on. So this, uh, these direct terms modify the, um, the inversely transform only in a f the first few uh, terms. And then after that, it just becomes this pure decay type situation. Well, let's take a look at what these um, simple poles look like. These, these direct terms, you know what those look like. Those are delta functions or delayed delta functions. So what can these things look like? Well, if the pole happens to be on the positive real axis, you get a simple decaying exponential type behavior. If it happens to be right on the unit circle um, at the value 1, then you get a step function. If it happens to lie outside the unit circle, then you get this um, unstable behavior where you get this growing exponential. On the other hand, if, it's on, uh, if the pole is on the negative real axis, then you get this alternating decaying envelope if, if the pole is inside the unit circle. On the unit circle would give you kind of the step function behavior, or outside the circle would give you an alternating growing uh, behavior. I will say this, that um, it becomes difficult to draw the pictures, but if the, um, the pole is inside the unit circle but lying off the real axis, then, then you, and, you, and you raise that pole to the power n, then basically you're generating complex exponential sequences with decaying amplitudes. If it lies on the unit circle, then those are the pure complex exponentials that do not decay as you move out towards positive infinity. And then if you're outside the unit circle, you get complex exponentials um, that expand, uh, and, that grow as you get towards positive infinity. Now let's look at the rest of the help message that scrolls out when you type help residue z. So it is possible that some of the poles uh, are repeated poles. In this case, maybe you have a second order pole. So in that case, that pole would be repeated in the answers that MATLAB gives you, and the residues, the corresponding residues, would be returned as well. But you get these, these um, higher order terms in the partial fraction expansion, and so uh, what, what actually happens here is that we get different forms for the inversely transform. So for this first order pole, um, I'm sorry, this is, this is a repeated pole, but you get this first order kind of behavior. So that's a simple um, decaying exponential times a unit step. And then you get, uh, notice that in the denominator here, it's 1 minus p z to the minus 1 squared. And so this, this kind of a term gives us a ramping signal. Here's n plus 1 times the decaying um, exponential. And uh, we'll take a look at what those kinds of signals look like. But I just want to make a note, even though um, it, there are some, some cases where you could get higher order poles, higher than 2, we're going to stick with, in this class, poles of multiplicity 2. And if you want to see what happens in the higher order case, again, I'll refer you back to this paper. So here's what these things actually look like in the time domain. So if we have a second order pole on the real axis,
Notice, remember with the first order pull, we had a pure delay or a pure decay. But now we have a ramping signal times a decay. So in the beginning, the signal ramps up and then the decay takes over and uh, you get this decaying long-term behavior. If the second order pull is on the unit circle, instead of a step function, you get a ramp function. And if it's outside the unit circle, you get this explosive behavior. Um, similar kinds of things can be said for poles inside, on, and outside the unit circle, but on the negative real axis, you get this alternating behavior. And then if you have second order poles away from the real axis, you get complex exponential behavior. Another kind of a pole pair that you could have is if the poles appear in complex conjugate pairs. Notice in this case you have a pole at P and a pole at P conjugate. Um, the residues in those cases will also appear in conjugates. And uh, if you write down the inverse transform, uh, you can combine these terms into a cosine where um, A and theta come, so, so the magnitude of the cosine and the phase of the cosine come from the, the residue A and the decaying uh, envelope portion and the frequency of the cosine come from the pole location. So R is the pole magnitude and uh, F naught is, is related to the angle of the pole. And if you want to know what those kinds of uh, conjugate pole pair, uh, pairs lead to in the inverse C transform, so here's a pair of complex conjugate poles. They are in magnitude less than one, so they're inside the unit circle. The angle is this frequency, omega naught, or F naught, if you want, if you would like to. And um, so we get this um, oscillating behavior, but the envelope decays. If those poles are on the unit circle, you get an oscillating behavior with non-decaying envelope. And then if those poles, uh, that conjugate pole pair is outside the unit circle, in the inverse E transform, you get oscillating explosive behavior. Before going on, I want to show you a few more MATLAB functions which are useful when doing calculations with Z-transforms, working homework problems, and so on. Um, this page shows us uh, four of these, and we'll talk about more of these in just a minute. But the first one I want to introduce you to is, is the function conv, which does convolution. And you're already familiar with this, I know, um, in convolving sequences. But remember that convolution is the operation at play when you are multiplying polynomials together. I know maybe you haven't thought of it this way before, but in fact when you're doing multiplication of uh, polynomials, you're really convolving their coefficient vectors. And so um, what we do is we represent this polynomial in terms of its coefficients. Its coefficients are 1 and negative 1. And so that's this little vector right here inside the conv function. And then this polynomial is, is represented by the vector 1, negative 1 half. And so that's this vector right here. Um, if, if you get out a piece of paper and check this calculation by working this out by hand, uh, you can do that. And you would verify uh, the same thing that the conv function gives you in MATLAB, and that is that the the uh, convolution of these two sequences is the, the vector 1, negative 1.5, 1 and 0 0.5. And so we could use that as the coefficients in a vector um, or, or in a polynomial, which is the product of these two polynomials. So you can see that in MATLAB you represent polynomials as vectors, and you can multiply polynomials by convolving vectors. The next function I want to introduce you to is the function called poly. Now what this function does is it takes in um, roots of a polynomial and it returns the coefficients of the polynomial. It's the opposite of factoring. And so um, let's take a look at this at these, um, these two, this example here where I have I have a, th this, this little polynomial right here has a root of 1 and this little polynomial right here has a root of 1 half. Now, um, so if you plug those, th those two numbers into the poly function, it spits out a, co a, a coefficient vector of the polynomial that has those as its roots. Again, this is the opposite of factoring. So this is another way you could calculate the same thing, maybe, uh, that the convolution function is calculating. Again, it's, it's good to know about both of these functions because they come in handy in different situations. 
Um, the roots function is kind of like factoring. It's rooting the polynomial. So if you plug in this coefficient vector 1 minus 0 0.5, 0 .0, 0 0.5, that's this polynomial. It's representing this polynomial. And um, it would spit out the roots, which are at 1 and 1 half. This is the example uh, that's running through the, uh, this uh, slide. And so we could, with those roots, we would then be able to write down this um, polynomial form, this factored polynomial form. Okay, so let's go back now and look at um, a rational function. So we're going to represent this rational function in the computer uh, as um, its numerator polynomial. So again, the coefficients of the numerator are 1 and 1. I'm going to put those numbers in this vector z. And the denominator polynomial is, um, are, are, is a product of these two given polynomials. So what I'm going to say is poly point 1 and point 0.5. Oh, I, I actually should have put negative point 0.5 there. So I think that's just a typo. Um, and then when I, when I pop this into the residue function, it does a partial fraction expansion for me. And it returns uh, as the residues 4 and negative 3. 4 corresponding to the pole at, z, at 1, and negative 3 corresponding to the pole at minus, uh, at 0.5. And um, uh, let's see, did I, did I do this right? Actually, um, oh yeah, here, here, are the, here are the solutions. This is what MATLAB returns. Um, no, why, why should I? Oh, no, no, no. I, I think I did this right. Yeah, the, poly, the, the roots are at 1 and 0.5. Yeah, sorry, making uh, mistakes here. Anyway, uh, but what, what the residue function returns is 4, negative 3 as the residues, so that's these numbers, and then 1 and 0.5, those are the, the corresponding poles. And so given the residues and the poles, we're able to just simply write down the partial fraction expansion. This is the part where you should be really jumping up and down and clapping your hands, because in the past, you would have to write down, you know, get out paper and pencil and write down this rational function and write down, you know, an unknown here for 4 and another unknown over here for, for negative 3. And then you'd, you'd go through some process following some steps to calculate what those things are. Um, but the residue z function, which is your new favorite MATLAB function, does the partial fraction expansion for you. All you have to do is take the results that it returns and write down the partial fraction expansion. In fact, if we're doing inverse z transforms, you don't even have to do that because all you have to, what we want to do is eventually get to the inverse z transform. So the inverse z transform of this term is 4, the residue, times the pole to the n, u of n, that is assuming that we're doing a causal um, inverse transform. So we're assuming the region of convergence is outside a circle of radius 1. That's the biggest pole. And, um, and then also take the, the residue negative 3 times the corresponding pole, 1 half, to the n u of n. And that's the inverse z transform. So given a rational function representation in the residue uh, function, you can basically write down the inverse z transform. This is the beautiful part. This is how you do partial fraction expansion and inverse z transforms on a computer. A couple of more MATLAB functions. Uh, we've already seen z-plane as an example of, some, of a function that will make a pole zero plot for you. Um, there's also another one here called freak z. This will plot the magnitude and phase of the um, frequency response. Again, uh, why is it able to do this? Because the DTFT, which is the frequency response, um, is equal to the z-transform evaluated on the unit circle. So, it does some calculations there and plots the magnitude and phase for, uh, for a rational function, uh, ma magnitude response and phase response. And then finally, um, we've seen this before too, the filter function, you pass in the numerator polynomial and the denominator polynomial. And, and remember, um, those two polynomials represent a difference equation. So given the input, you can basically um, write a function that, or MATLAB has written a function, it's called filter, and it, uh, it iterates that difference equation and calculates the output. <clears throat> so hopefully now you understand this function filter a little bit better. It's, it's implementing a difference equation for the, uh, for the coefficients in B and the coefficients in A and the input in X. <clears throat>
Um, how about calculating the first 100 samples of the impulse response? Well, what is the impulse response? The impulse response is what comes out of the system when you put in an impulse. How do you represent an impulse in MATLAB? Well, you create a, a vector that has a 1 in the beginning and then it's zeros after that. So this is a sample, a, a, a vector of 100 samples of an impulse function. If that goes into a linear time invariant system represented by B and A, then what comes out must be the impulse response. So there it is. Um, but if you weren't satisfied with that, what if we wanted to calculate the analytical expression for the impulse response? Um, again, this is easy now because residue z allows us to calculate the inverse z transform of the transfer function. Uh, and for linear time invariant systems, the transfer function will be no worse than a rational function represented by b and a. There it is. Um, all right, let's move on. Let's take a look at an inverse z transform example. This one's maybe a little bit more complicated than some others that we've seen. So let's step through this. Okay, first of all, we're given a difference equation representation for a system. y of n is equal to 1 half y n minus 1 plus the new input x of n. <clears throat> we want to write this in canonical form. So what we're going to do is take this Take all the outputs to one side of the equation. Now we see this uh, a difference equation in canonical form. We can, we can now write down the transfer function by inspection. So the polynomial in the numerator is just going to be 1. And the denominator polynomial is going to be 1 minus 0 0.5 times z to the minus 1, where the yn minus 1 would be. So, so we write down this um, rational uh, z transform, or this rational function, by inspection of the difference equation. We don't have to do any work. That's just by inspection. The other thing that we know is that um, we're running this recursion forward in time, so it's going to give us a causal um, output. And, and because we're causal and we have a pole at 1 half, we know the region of convergence for this z-transform is going to be greater than 1 half, outside a circle of radius 1 half. Now, uh, because this happens to be one of these simple forms, we can also write down, by almost by inspection here too, um, the impulse response, which is the inverse z-transform. Um, that's given here, 1 half to the n u of n. Now let's suppose I want to put into this system this uh, causal sequence 10 times cosine pi n over 4. Um, we can look up in a table the Fourier transform for this, and uh, that's just given by this formula. I just look it up in the table. I'm not going to talk about that anymore, other than to say that we should consider the region of convergence, um, and that is uh, all z's greater than 1. So unfortunately, the unit circle is not in the region of convergence. That's because this has a non-decaying envelope. But uh, anyway, this is the example. Now, if we wanted to calculate the output, we could use this z-transform property, which says that the convolution in time is equal to multiplication in the z-domain. So what we're going to do is we're going we're to multiply the two z-transforms together, and then we're going to calculate the inverse z-transform. Let's take a look at the steps involved here. So first of all, let's multiply the z-transforms together. You can see I've brought this uh, trans the z-transform for x together with the z-transform for h, multiplied those together, and we get this expression. Let's also think about the region of convergence. Uh, if we intersect these two regions, the region for h and the region for x, we see that the intersection is going to be all the points greater than 1 in magnitude. And, um, and then finally, how do we calculate the inverse z transform? Um, that's easy with the residue z function. We just have to represent the numerator polynomial and the denominator polynomial in, in MATLAB in terms of vectors. So how do we do that? Well, the numerator polynomial is easy. It's 10 times 1, and then the second coefficient is going to be negative 1 over root 2. So we have that vector, that's the numerator polynomial. What is the denominator polynomial? Well, it's going to be the product. Here I've noticed that when I wrote this down, I actually took the x um, denominator and I factored it into its, its components. But um, when I'm expressing this in the computer, 
I'm just going to, I, what, I want to what I need is one polynomial for the denominator. I don't want it in this factored form. So what I'm going to do is multiply this polynomial together with this polynomial. How do I multiply polynomials in MATLAB? Convolution. So we're going to take this, uh, this polynomial, which is the vector 1 minus 1 half. That's here. And this polynomial, which is the vector 1, negative root 2, 1. That's this polynomial. And so this convolution is the denominator polynomial. You pop those into the residue function, and out comes the answer. So here's actually a screenshot from MATLAB. Um, uh, plugging that same thing in, uh, it spits out the residues, which are here, these complex numbers. It would be nice if these were nice numbers, but they're not. Um, here are the poles. Again, it would be nice if those were nice numbers, but they're not. And the direct terms, there are no direct terms because this is a proper rational function. The numerator has order 1, the denominator has order 3. Um, so the numerator is lower order than the denominator. So this is a proper rational function. There would be no direct terms in this case. So, I don't know, trying to make this thing easy, I think our textbook does this sometimes. I took these, uh, the residues and the poles, which are given from, in MATLAB in rectangular coordinates, and I expressed them in terms of polar coordinates. I took the absolute value and the angle um, then multiplied by 180 over pi to express them in degrees. Um, I did the same thing with the poles. You can see that the poles have magnitude 1, so they're on the unit circle, and one is at positive 45 degrees, one is at negative 45 degrees. That's pi over 4 radians. <clears throat> and, um, and so we, we can take these numbers and just write down the inverse Z transform. We can write down the answer. So the answer is this. We're going to take this first pole right here, negative 1.91 rounding, and that corresponds to the third pole. Here's the third pole. So the third coefficient corresponds to the third pole. That's 0.5 to the n u of n. Okay. Now, let's go and look at these other poles. Notice that this, or, or these poles, notice that this pair of poles occurs in conjugate pairs. And it's, the corresponding residues also occur in conjugate pairs. And so um, I could write down, I'm going to use the polar representation in this case. So I'm going to write down the, the residue. So we have 6.78 times e to the j 28.7 degrees. Remember, you can't really use degrees. You'd have to re-express this in radians by multiplying by pi over 180. Um, so I write that down. Uh, and then I also write down the corresponding pole. So this is going to be 1 times e to the j pi over 4 raised to the nth power times u of n. And again, we can, and, and I, so I do that with the, the two conjugate pole pairs and their conjugate residues. We get these two things. But we can factor the, the constant out and combine the exponentials. And when we do that, we get a cosine, in fact. Um, and you can see that cosine right here. So, so the whole, th so this is one of those special cases where we get a pair of complex conjugate poles. Uh, I just want to show you that, yeah, that can happen, especially when we put a, a cosine wave into this linear time invariant system. We would sort of expect to get a cosine out, but we also get this transient piece, uh, which is uh, which decays pretty rapidly and goes away, and then we're just left in the steady state with this cosine part. Notice that the cosine coming out has the same. Uh, frequency as the cosine going in. It just has a different magnitude and phase, which is the type of behavior that we expect um, with linear time invariant systems. There's going to be a transient which decays. This, Of course, this never truly decays to exactly zero, but for all practical purposes, this is going to decay pretty rapidly. And then um, we'll be left with just this uh, sinusoid in the steady state. So there's an example. Uh, where we started with um, a system given in, by, by a difference equation, an input that we wanted to run into that difference equation. We go into the z domain, multiply, and then use the residue z to do the inverse transform. That would take all of just a couple of minutes uh, to, to work out a problem like that, uh, as long as you have MATLAB handy. And for other z transform examples, I would encourage you to look in our textbook. and. Um, Try to reproduce the results of examples in the book uh, using the residue z function in MATLAB.
Now let's move on and talk about some system algebra concepts. Um, we are interested in looking here at series and parallel cascades and um, understanding what this means. And we can, we've seen this sort of thing before. If you have a, a series cascade of two systems, we know that in the time domain we convolve their impulse responses. So in the z domain, we're going to multiply their transfer functions. Also, if we have a parallel cascade of two systems running in parallel, um, fed by the same inputs, their outputs being added together, then um, the, the uh, combined system would just add their transfer functions. Um, where would this be useful? Here, here's one of the places this could be useful. If we found, uh, if we're given a system H and we found another system G, so that in the Z domain when I multiply their transfer functions together I get 1, we could call Z um, the inverse system of H. And if H has a rational function uh, uh, expansion, then we, could, we would know that the inverse system has the reciprocal relation between A and B. Um, in the time domain, again, what is this saying? This is telling us that if we convolve G with H, the combination is a delta function, which is the identity system. So, so we call G the inverse of H. Now, here's something to think about. Let's suppose h of n, or, or h of z, is a causal stable system. Remember, for causal and stable, all of the poles must be inside the unit circle. And let's suppose that we also want g, the inverse, to be causal and stable. What would, what would be required in that case? Well, notice that the poles of g are the zeros of h. Because b contains the zeros of h, but b is the, the denominator polynomial of g, so the zeros, are, the zeros of h are the poles of g. So if we wanted g to be causal and stable also, we would need its poles to be inside the unit circle. And its poles are the zeros of, g, of h. And so if you have a system that's causal and stable, and its inverse is causal and stable, then all of its poles and its zeros must lie inside the unit circle. And systems that have this property are referred to as minimum phase. And I would encourage you to read in the textbook on the properties of minimum phase systems. Let's take a, a look at an example here, a numerical example uh, of systems algebra. Um, so here I have uh, a system, uh, H1, and another system, H2. And let's suppose that these are in parallel cascades so that uh, the combined response would be the sum. How would we calculate this in MATLAB? Well, um, let's suppose N1 and D1 are vectors that represent the numerator and denominator co uh, polynomials of H1. And the same true for H2. N2 and D2 are vectors that represent its numerator and denominator. You can check these numbers. I think I've typed these incorrectly. There's a lot of typing here. Um, plenty of places to make mistakes, but I think I've done that right. Now, how do we find the numerator polynomial of H and the denominator polynomial of H? Well, the denominator polynomial is going to be a common denominator between H1 and H2. So all we have to do is multiply these two polynomials together. And so that's given by this expression right here that you see. I'm just convolving the two denominators together. But then uh, in the process of finding a common denominator, we, mu we multiply the, the numerator of H1 by the denominator of H2 and the numerator of H2 by the denominator of H1 in the process of, of getting that common denominator. And so we would do those multiplications of those polynomials, and then we could add those things together. Uh, the nice thing is if you enter the polynomials incorrectly um, without making any mistakes, you know MATLAB is not going to make any mistakes when it does its convolutions. So um, this would give us the final answer for the numerator polynomial of the combined system. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look at the zeros of the combined system. So I'm going to use the roots function to look at the roots of the numerator polynomial. And I've uh, copied those in here, uh, what MATLAB returned. And also the, the roots of the denominator polynomial of the combined system. And I've copied those numbers in here. And um, I'd like to just make an observation. Uh, notice that um, the 
the uh, roots of the numerator polynomial uh, include two, a second order root at minus 0.8. And the denominator also includes a second order uh, root at minus 0.8. And so those, those poles and zeros then are going to cancel. And so if we wanted to just eliminate those um, from consideration, what we could do is form a new polynomial for the numerator by taking the zeros, zeros number one and number four, and then um, that would give us this polynomial that you see here. And then uh, we could omit these uh, two poly these uh, the duplicated roots that are being canceled, and just take uh, the roots from po polynomial. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the poles three and four, 0.5 and 0.3, and form that polynomial d as the new denominator polynomial. And then you take these uh, lists of coefficients, and you just write down. The, um, the new polynomial. Again, I hope you're jumping up and down and clapping your hands here because what we've done is if, if we can just sort of keep things straight in our minds, if we can enter the, date, the numbers in correctly at the first, we can use MATLAB's built-in functions all the way along to do all the terrible arithmetic uh, that is so easy to make mistakes on and end up with the right answer. One of the things that we, we need to do is be careful uh, when we're resynthesizing things and inspect for pole zero cancellations along the way that can happen. And that takes us to the end of the discussion on Z transform. Uh, after this uh, discussion, after watching these two videos, or, or these videos, you should be able to work all of the homework problems uh, related to the Z transform. And uh, the next step is to apply these properties of the Z-transform that we've learned about to additional um, analysis on systems. And then we'll round out the semester with filter design.